Hey, thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. Went to a refinery last week. Hopefully got a lot more stories to tell you about that. Today we're going to talk about generators. You know it. We're uh, here for the masses and uh, what we've got is a, a good technical discussion on what can go wrong with generators and uh, basically how we will uh, manage those risks going forward. We'll uh, talk about equipment failure and uh, believe it or not, this presentation was a lot longer. I did cut out uh, several sections, but we'll talk about what can go wrong and then how we manage risks on generators. Before we get too far into it, I wanna show you a, a little video because uh, there's a difference between power generators and the typical generators we all learned about in elementary school, junior high school, depending on where you were. But uh, let's quickly go over and take a look at uh, this video. We'll go to Or maybe video we can works. use the energy of the falling water. Or another example could be, we fit these inside giant windmills and let the wind do the work for us. Whichever way you choose, all we do is spin a giant turbine. But how does turning something create electricity? Well, the technology is based on electromagnetic induction, discovered by Michael Faraday more than 200 years ago. The basic idea is that if you take a wire and move it up or down inside a magnetic field, it induces an electric current. So all we have to do is attach a coil of wire to these giant turbines and place them inside a magnetic field. As the turbine rotates, the coil starts rotating and the wires start moving up and down inside the magnetic field that produces the electric current. Okay, so we're going to tell you that right off the bat that in power generators, it's just the opposite. We don't spin a coil inside of a magnet. We spin the magnet inside of the coil. Uh, that's okay. It, it, it still works. And uh, what we're looking at right now is a generator field uh, or the magnet. Right, so this is a large electromagnet. It needs to be excited, and if you remember in school when we tied wire around a nail and hooked it up to a battery, we turned it into a magnet. That's what we're doing here. We've got coils of wire going around this rotor, and we're creating an electromagnet that's going to turn inside the stator. Stator sounds like stationary, so that's the part that doesn't move. That's the the outer coil that we're going to induce the electricity into. So uh, let's uh, get over here and uh, keep going. So we're going to talk about the failure mechanisms. What are the things that can cause damage to uh, our large generators? Well, when we're looking at the generators, I, I, I want to point out some of the things that I've seen as far as uh, adjusting claims and being involved in claims. Shorted end turns and retaining rings. Uh, we haven't really had a retaining ring failure. They, they were happening before I came along, so to speak, but uh, we have seen a, a, a large push early on in the industry to address that. The uh, um, problem was the material that the retaining rings were made of was susceptible to intergranular stress corrosion cracking, and these rings could burst suddenly. And uh, that could be very catastrophic when that happened. So the other uh, type of loss that we can have are shorted end turns. Let's talk about the end turns for a minute. Uh, basically on the inside, if you take that retaining ring off, that big metal retaining ring, at the end of all of the coils, they have to make a turn. So these coils are uh, long copper bars that are attached to more copper that is curved to make it around the rotor. So how does this straight bar attach to the curved bar? Well, you can make a butt braze. They're brazed. They're not welded. They're brazed, which means they're basically glued with other metal. So you can, you can do a butt braze where one bar just touches the edge of another bar, or you can do an overlapping braze where the two bars overlap. Well, that's a much stronger connection. And over the years of a rotor heating up and cooling down, all of these braze joints are susceptible to stresses. So a cycling machine is gonna have more likely to have a problem with uh, the end turns than a machine that just gets up and runs at steady state. Now, how can you tell if you've got a shorted end turn? Well, if you're running the plant, if you are trying to start the unit up and you start to see vibrations as the load increases, well, that could be shorted end turns. 
uh, what, what's going on is if that short of the, uh, as that braze breaks or disconnects, that bar now touches the other bar. And you can see how close these bars, if I get out of, my, out of your way here, you can see how close the uh, bars are together and uh, you don't want them touching. That becomes a short circuit and the electricity starts to take that path because it's the path of least resistance. Well, when it does that, as electricity flows, so does heat, right? So as the electricity starts to find that path of least resistance, it builds up heat on one side. Since it's not flowing on the other side, we start to see a deformation and we start to see the, the warm side get longer and the cool side has to get shorter. So that rotor actually bows. As the load goes up, the vibration gets worse because there's more load. So that would be an indication that you've got a shorted end turn as if your vibration follows the load. Let's keep moving. All right, so what else can cause the damage? Well, mechanical fatigue and wear. We talked about, you know, every time these units start up and shut down, they heat up and cool down. So they need to do that evenly. Corrosion and erosion. They're either air-cooled or hydrogen-cooled. The air-cooled units are drawing in lots of air, and uh, that can lead to uh, abrasion uh, if you're bringing in dirty air, and it can lead to corrosion if you're bringing in air from, say, the uh, near the ocean where there's salt water uh, that can cause corrosion in the air. Overheating and thermal stress. If you're overloading your generator, which is not likely, most generators are sized for the transformer for the uh, generator step up. Now, in a, in a chemical facility, chemical manufacturing, or in a uh, refinery where you've got your own on-site power generation, yeah, you can overload it. So uh, that can cause uh, overheating and thermal stress. Alrighty, this is uh, a large power generator and uh, just uh, giving you another look at them. Electrical faults, what can go wrong causing the electrical faults? We, we talked a little bit about the uh, shorted end turns. Dynamics issues, the imbalance. Uh, sometimes the rotors can uh, be out of resonance. There, there could be a resonance frequency that uh, stimulates higher vibrations than they normally would see at their typical operating speeds contamination and foreign object damage. Again, uh, if you're breathing in a lot of air to cool it, if the air's not clean, we're gonna contaminate the inside. And then once you've got contamination, then you start to get, build up the chance for short circuits again. And overheating because you're not cooling the material. Manufacturing defects in the materials. So again, these machines are being put together in a factory somewhere, they're being shipped across the world. And then when you go install them, hopefully everything is right. We didn't have a uh, incident on the way that we're gonna discover early in the life of this machine. That's typically when we discover uh, manufacturing defects and problems with the materials. All right, where do they fail? The stator in the rotor, uh, vibrations, electrical loading, insulation failure, again, winding shorts. This is where uh, we, can, we can see a, a problem in the, the rotor. Uh, again, this is the stator, gives you an idea of what they look like. Now, again, these stators can be hydrogen cooled or they can be air cooled. And when they're hydrogen cooled, you've got hydrogen flowing through all of those bars. They're hollow bars and uh, that introduces a fire hazard. Well, in order to keep that fire hazard in the generator, keep that hydrogen in the generator, we have hydrogen seal oil. That's a whole nother lecture, whole nother topic. But uh, if the seal oil system's not working, you gotta be careful because the hydrogen can leak out. So uh, that, it's a very critical and important system. Cooling system malfunctions. I've seen air-cooled generators where the uh, air cooler is just a water radiator, just like you have in front of your car or truck, and they don't last forever. And this generator, uh, it, it failed and it was due to the cooling system just suddenly uh, letting go and, and, and leaking water down into the unit. Uh, it was interesting, the adjuster wanted to exclude the uh, coverage. Basically, he said that, oh, well, this was in need of repair. Everybody knew it was damaged. You never did any maintenance on that cooler. Well, guess what? <laughs> After the cooler failed, the damage occurred to the generator, which was running the day before. It wasn't damaged. The cooler was the only thing that needed to be fixed. So you can exclude the cooler. You can't exclude the repair to the generator. So we won that one. This is a uh, close-up of what it looks like inside these stator bars, and this was for an investigation where we had some hydrogen leaking, and uh, it was leaking due to crevice corrosion cracking. 
Remember we talked about the bearings and the seals. We've got hydrogen in this unit, so we've got to keep that seal oil flowing or we've got a potential for a fire. This is a close-up of what it looks like on one of these machines where the uh, bearings are. Alrighty, auxiliary controls. We have uh, your hydrogen system. You have to control the addition of hydrogen so that they have a whole complete hydrogen system. You have to manage the risk of, of how you're adding it, how you're monitoring it for leakage and how often you're changing your bottles. All right, close up of a uh, field getting ready to be pulled out of the stator. Now let's talk about managing the risks, finally, right? We know a little bit about what, what's out there and what can go wrong. Let's, let's assess the risks and prioritize the assets. Figure out which of our units are the most important, which ones will shut down the entire plant, which most power generators, that is your plant. Everything is there to make that thing turn. But in a uh, refinery or petrochemical facility, you may have redundant power generation or you may be able to rely on the grid for a little while. So uh, you need to determine what's your most critical assets before you start your risk assessments. And then you want to prioritize them based on what's critical. Uh, are there any regulatory requirements? Do you have any contractual obligations? What's been the historical failure data for that particular machine? If you happen to have a machine that has known fleet issues elsewhere, well, that's going to raise the priority of what you're looking at, right? Now we're going to establish inspection and testing protocols. This is where we decide how often we're going to look at it and what we're going to do to it. Okay, we want to make sure that we're looking at the mechanical, electrical, and structural components. Uh, it's important that the structural components are tight and secure because if they uh, loosen during operations, then you're looking at a uh, potential failure. Alrighty, we're going to define the inspection frequencies, the methodologies, what our criteria for acceptance, uh, what our procedures for documenting the uh, work are. We're going to make sure we keep all that documentation. All right, we'll have routine inspections and uh, we'll also do condition monitoring. So, all right, what do we mean by routine inspections? In routine inspections, we've got non-destructive testing. Uh, we've got things that are uh, monitoring the condition of the unit for abnormal uh, wear and tear. So getting a little bit more detailed in that, we're looking at like vibration analysis, partial discharge analysis, thermography, oil analysis, ultrasonic testing. All these are uh, tests to help you detect the, the health of your generator. Now we talked about shorted end turns. I didn't put it on here, but uh, one of the tests that you can do to determine if you've got a shorted end turn when the unit is not running is called repetitive surge ice, uh, oscillograph, RSO, repetitive surge oscillograph. It injects a signal into the stationary field and then through all of its black box magic tells you if one of the end turns is shorted or not. So if you suspect it and you don't want to put it into a machine and run it to figure out does it follow load does the vibration follow load repetitive surge oscillograph is a uh, option all righty now getting down into it these are some of the things that you're going to want to do uh, to maintain and inspect your machine and uh, highlights the NDE of the retaining rings that's really important once you do it once you either know you have the good ones or you have the bad ones so you don't have to keep doing this over and over uh, looking at uh, partial discharge is something that we see some of the times. Uh, we don't see it everywhere. It can be recommended by the insurance companies to uh, improve reliability. Alrighty. Now, scheduled maintenance. Uh, we're not just looking and we're not just doing condition. We're actually going to take things apart and clean them because it's important. Remember, I said we're drawing, drawing in all that air with the cooling fans. And when we do that, we're bringing in dust, moisture, and they build up. We've got to clean it out. So how do we do that? Well, a minor inspection, usually this is uh, once every one to three years, that uh, we don't have to disassemble it, but we're gonna do a winding resistance test, insulation resistance test, power factor test. And for the rotor, see we're gonna do the uh, turn short test, the insulation resistance test, and uh, that gets us through the miners every one to three years. Every five to seven years, we're looking at a major inspection, okay? But no more than 10 years. 
and you have to pull the uh, rotor, the field, out of the stator. And then in addition to all those, we do a slot discharge, corona probe test, or a partial discharge analysis. Now, where did all this come from? Came from one of the largest insurance company uh, engineering groups out there. And uh, they have a, a workbook for power generation. And uh, this is pretty much what uh, they recommend for keeping your generators clean and healthy. So we want to develop a, a good program. We're going to make sure it's lubricated, cleaned, it's aligned, and everything's calibrated. That's the only way that we're going to keep it running in top-notch condition and giving us the best efficiency. We're going to schedule downtime. We're not just going to wait for something to break. We're going to plan it. We're going to know that these things will not run forever. And uh, based on the, the work that we have to do, we'll have the downtime during the turnarounds and the outages to get it done. All right. So. Generator risk management boils down to establishing what the uh, priorities are, what your most important generators are. Figure out what you're gonna do to inspect and test it, then set up your routines for uh, condition monitoring and those inspections, and then schedule the maintenance. Get in there and clean it and make sure that it's running right. With that, uh, you have to then keep track of all the work, right? You have to have uh, record keeping. And this is really important because uh, in the record keeping, you will be able to document what the initial trouble was and what the solution, attempted solution was, so that future troubleshooters can see either what worked or what didn't work. So it's very critical to have a history on your equipment. Um, when you, you have that history, you also have the ability, you can go back and look and see, is this machine getting better? Is it getting worse? It, am, are we spending uh, maintenance dollars over and over and over that we should just go ahead and replace the generator or should we do a special repair? So we really need to keep a, a good maintenance history. Some companies have computerized maintenance management systems. In fact, most do. Uh, it's a good way to keep track of all that. Not only you know when is it time to do the uh, maintenance, but what was done in the past, and and you know what were the results of uh, that work order. So there we go. These are the the steps to generator risk management. Again, it ends with documentation and record keeping. And I'll say thanks. And uh, hopefully, y'all made it here. And um, with uh, some more videos to come, keep coming back. Say some comments in the bottom so you so I know what you're looking for. And uh, stick around. We'll be doing it some more. Thanks.